I'm a child of the 90s and 2000s, which means I still remember my family's, one of our most important weekend rituals, uh, going to Blockbuster. Now, I used to love video stores. Uh, when I was in college, my favorite video store here in uh, Columbia was 9th Street Video. It was kind of the indie place. And so every time I would go there, I would talk to whoever was behind the desk and ask, hey, what's the next film I should watch? And doing that, I got to know the manager of the store a little bit. And one day, he somehow realized that I'm a Christian. And so he looks at me and says, you know what? Do you want to get the, the best cinematic depiction of what Christianity does to people? Kind of gave me a little scoff. He goes, you want to know the best cinematic depiction of what believing in God is going to do to you? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever you say. And he handed me a copy of the 1975 film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I said, okay. So I took it home and I, I watched it. And it tells the story of Randall McMurphy. When you meet him, he's a prisoner in a state prison doing hard labor. And he decides he kind of wants a more cush existence. So he's going to feign mental illness so that he'll get sent to what back in those days would have been called an asylum, a psychiatric hospital. And his plan, it succeeds. He gets there, but much to his chagrin, he realizes that it's far worse than prison. This asylum is run by a megalomaniacal nurse named Nurse Ratched, and she controls everyone. She, she's constantly surveilling everyone, and if you disobey her, you'll get straitjackets. You'll get electroshocks, and if it gets bad enough, she'll lobotomize you, which is where they literally stick something inside your brain and stir it up and turn you into a human vegetable. And as he's around her, he begins to realize that it's absolutely insane. The guys he's around, though, they're great guys. They're kind, they're wise, they're good-hearted. And he looks at him and he says, there's nothing wrong with you. You aren't, you aren't mentally ill. The thing that's making you feel insane is Nurse Ratched and all of her control, all of her restrictions. She's the insane one. You're totally with it. And then he discovers something incredible. Most of the men in the asylum are there by choice. They didn't think that they could live out in normal society, out in the normal world. They thought that they had to be in the asylum. And so he makes it his personal goal to show them that they need to get out. And so he begins to break all of Nurse Ratched's rules. He begins to flaunt all of her rules and regulations and limitations. And so she starts subjecting him to electroshock therapy over and over and over again. And finally, he plans a breakout. They're all going to be free from all of her rules, all of her limitations, all of her insanity, but on that very night, she lobotomizes him and she turns him into a human vegetable. And in the end, she wins. See, that was my friend's picture of what it's like to follow God, of what it's like to be a Christian. The God of the Bible is some sort of divine nurse ratchet, a sadomasochistic control freak who's only interested in taking away your freedoms, controlling your every action, watching what you do. So I get back to the movie place and I bring the DVD back and I hand it to him because he was there. I said, hey, Why'd you say this is the best cinematic depiction of what it's like to be a Christian? He said, because God is just like Nurse Ratched. God doesn't love freedom. God wants to control you. Christianity is a straitjacket. I mean, why do you care so much? If what I'm doing doesn't hurt anyone, why isn't it wrong? Why, why don't you want freedom? I think it's a really good question. I think it's a good question because it's a question, chances are, that you've asked yourself it's a question that I know, I know many people have asked and it's kept them from believing in Jesus. Right now we're going through this series, Making Sense of God, and we're asking what are the things that are keeping us from following, walking with Jesus? How do we make sense of that? And I think this is one of the main things. Doesn't Jesus hate freedom? Doesn't Jesus limit us? Isn't Jesus a straitjacket? Now, I think this is also an interesting question, not just because we ask it, but also because it stands in absolute contradiction to what God says about himself in the Bible. According to the Bible, God loves freedom. God is the world's first freedom fighter. In the book of Exodus, we read the story of how the Israelites were enslaved for centuries. And God, he doesn't put up with it. He sends someone to set them free from Pharaoh and all the Egyptians. We read this in Exodus 5.1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, that was the king of Egypt, and said, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel says, these are the words of God, let my people go. God loves freedom. 
And Jesus, when he came, he came to start a second exodus. Only this time he wasn't freeing people from Egyptian oppression. He was freeing people from the oppression of sin that enslaves all of us inside our hearts. And that's why he said this in John 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Uh, The apostle Paul went on later and said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Christ has set you free from death. Christ has set you free from sin. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. But it's not just God the Father and God the Son who love freedom. The Holy Spirit is a freedom fighter. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And what's he gonna say about the Spirit? And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And it's not just God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The trajectory of reality, the trajectory of the biblical story is ultimately towards freedom. You are going to the most free place in the universe when you are resurrected, when you live in this renewed creation on a renewed earth. This is what Paul said about that future reality. The creation itself, this world, will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. God loves freedom. God made you for freedom. God wants to set you free. So doesn't it make you ask, or at least wonder the question, how did it happen that so many people, in fact, many of us here, have felt the exact opposite to be the case? How did God go from the divine freedom fighter to the divine sadomasochistic control freak who wants to put us in a straitjacket. How did that happen? Where did that idea come from? And to answer that question, I need to talk to you about memoirs, pears, and asparagus. It's gonna make sense. Just go with me on this, okay? So in Western literature, there are two very famous books which share a title, The Confessions, or Les Confessions if you're looking at it in French. Now, here's the thing. They don't just share a title. They have a lot in common. They are both autobiographies. They're memoirs, and they're both deeply philosophical. In other words, they're drawing things about the meaning of life from just everyday experience, from personal life. That's not the only thing they have in common. Both stories hinge on a theft, someone stealing something. Let's talk about the older book. It was by an African man named Augustine of Hippo. And and Augustine, in his confessions, he writes the story about how when he was a teenager, him and his friends all decided it's gonna be a fun trick to go in the middle of the night into a pear orchard. And when they get there, they start stealing all these pears and they get away in the cover of night and they get back home. And once the fun is all over, Augustine is guilt stricken. He thinks, man, I'm a pretty wealthy young man and I just stole a bunch of pears from a poor farmer who couldn't afford to lose them. Why in the world did I do this? And he starts analyzing the situation. He starts looking inside his heart and he discovers something that was deeply disturbing. He realizes, I wanted to do this. I don't care who gets hurt. I don't care what the costs are to them. And when he saw that reality in his heart, he realized that his heart was sick, that something was terribly wrong with with his heart, that something was caging it. You see, he realized and he posited that not just him, but all people, the thing that was keeping us from being free in life was the cage of sin that's around every single human heart. The thing that's keeping you from being free is the cage of evil that guides you to follow yourself, to follow your desires. It's the cage of pride, of idolatry, of selfishness. And this is what Jesus meant when he said in John 8, you will know the truth. The truth is that I have come to set you free from sin and that truth will set you free in the most important way. So for St. Augustine, freedom equals freedom from internal sin. Freedom is freedom from internal sin. It's freedom from myself, freedom from sin. Let's go to that second book called The Confessions. This one was written much later in the 1700s by a Frenchman named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It was actually published after he died. But in this story, he tells about a similar theft. He and his teenage friends get together and they decide in the middle of the night that they're going to go steal some asparagus. I don't know why they're stealing asparagus, but that's what they did in France back then, I guess, okay? So they go into this asparagus field and they are stealing stocks of asparagus and they get back and once the fun's all over, Rousseau is guilt-stricken. He can't believe what he's just done. Now this is where he parts ways with Augustine. He looks inside his heart and you know what he sees? My heart is pure. 
My heart is good. I didn't want to steal those asparagus. I didn't want to be out there in that field doing that. Why I did it was because of external pressure. It was because my friends around me telling me, hey, we should go steal the asparagus together. That was the reason why I did it. All of the external pressure. And he takes that personal experience and he expands it. And he posits that the exact same thing happens in our life. That the thing that makes us do the wrong things is that we don't follow our hearts. And the reason we don't follow our hearts is because of external pressure. The pressure of society, the pressure of social norms, the pressure of the church, the pressure of laws, the pressure of family, the pressure of friends. He said, the real key, the real way to be free then is to be free from external, from external prohibitions. So again, let's go back and look at this, okay? So freedom for Augustine is freedom from internal sin, but freedom for Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it's not being free from the thing inside me, it's being free from everything outside me, from external pressure, Augustine taught freedom is being free from myself. Rousseau taught freedom is being free to express myself. You realize there's two different definitions of freedom out there and they're totally contrary to one another. And my friend who was at that movie store, he was a spiritual descendant of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And so to him, it was just self-evident that the definition of freedom was the freedom of self-expression. It was the freedom to do whatever I want. It was just self-evident. Obviously, that's what freedom is. And the truth is, it's not just him. It's you and me in our culture, in our moment. We are all the spiritual descendants of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. We default. Our definition of freedom is freedom to express myself, is freedom from external limitations, from external restrictions. Now, if you're anything like me, I kind of like to question the things that I grew up with and just say, hey, is that right? Does, you know, under scrutiny, does that still make sense? And because you grew up in a culture that taught you that's what freedom means, just be true to yourself, follow your heart, that's the definition of freedom. Make sure there's no limitations, any restrictions, that's what enslaves you. Have you ever actually questioned it? Have you ever actually analyzed it? Like under scrutiny, does this idea actually make sense that anything that limits me or restricts me also restricts my freedom? Let's do that. Let me give you a few little parables. Uh, Let's start with a a guy, a 65-year-old man, a retiree, and he's going into the doctor's office to do his normal checkups. And as he's sitting there, he's telling the doctor, man, I just retired and I am so excited. I'm excited to go on vacation. I'm gonna eat all the food I want. I'm gonna have steak. It's gonna be awesome. He goes, the other thing though, is I get to watch my grandkids grow up. I don't have to be at work all the time. I'm just so pumped to be retired. And the doctor looks at him. He smiles, but (laughs) you tell his got something to say. He says, look, I don't want to tell you this, but we got your results back on your heart test and we realize that you're at severe risk for heart disease. And if you don't make a radical change in how you eat, you're not going to live to see your grandkids grow up. Now he's got a choice. He can restrict his diet. He can limit his diet and see his grandkids grow up, or he can follow his heart and eat whatever he wants. Let's do a different one. There's a woman and she loves freedom. She loves being free, but she falls in love with this guy and they've been dating for two years and it's going pretty well. And one day her friend calls her and she says, hey, you won't believe this. I just got tickets to our favorite band tomorrow, but it's in a different city. Do you wanna go with me? She's like, oh yeah, I would definitely love to go. Just let me call my boyfriend and talk about our weekend plans really quick to make sure that everything's squared away. Her friend's kind of like, call your boyfriend and ask. What kind of guy are you dating? You have to call and get permission from him? And so again, she's faced with a choice. She can limit her schedule, limit her freedom, so that she can have a relationship where there's clear lines of communication and trust and self-sacrificial love, or she can be free to do whatever she wants with her time. Let me give you one more illustration. This one's from real life. Um, This is Akihiko Kondo. And he's always struggled in his life to connect with real life human women. And that's why he, uh, alongside tens of thousands of other men, has committed himself to an anime character. In this case, Hatsune Miku. She's a celebrity. She's gone on tour with Lady Gaga. And he's committed himself to her. They spend their whole life together. They eat meals together. They go on trips together. And he says that he loves being with her because it's a lot better than being with a human. She'll never betray him. She'll never let him down. She'll never say anything that challenges him. He doesn't have to worry about any of that. And because he loves her so much, he's decided that he wants to get married to her. And so he did, he, he, he got married to her. And this was all good and great until his parents came along and said, hey, I, I don't know if this is what's best for you. 
Is this psychologically healthy to have a deep relationship with a fictional character? In fact, there's a word for this. They're called fictosexuals. And, and this, is, this, is this really what's, what's best for you? I, I mean, don't you want real life, human connection? And he looked at him and he said, no, I, I love my relationship. I, I told my counselor, and, he, and my counselor told me, look, if it's making you happy and it's not hurting anyone, then why not do it? What do you think? You see, in each of these cases, there's external pressure, external voices that are trying to cage each person in. For the retiree, it's the voice of his doctor caging in his diet. Uh, for, for, for the woman who's dating that man, it's her boyfriend who's caging in her schedule. For the fictosexual, it's his parents caging in his marital status. Each of them has an external voice caging them, but now you're beginning to see the nub. Do limitations really limit your freedom? Because here's the deal. Yes, the retiree, he has to restrict his diet, but if he does that, he gets a deeper freedom, which is to see his grandkids grow up. Yes, that gal, she might have to restrict her schedule and not just be able to say, I can go wherever I want to. But when she does that, she gets the deeper freedom of having a self-giving, communicative relationship. The fictosexual, he might have to say, no, I'm not going to have a relationship with a fictional character. But then I get to say yes to the deeper freedom of having real life, human connection. You see, limitation, restriction, they are not opposed to freedom. They are necessary for the deepest and truest freedoms. Let's say that you wanna be an elite athlete. You will have to relinquish where you choose to live. You will have to relinquish your schedule, what you eat, how you discipline yourself, because to have the deeper freedom of being an elite athlete, that's what you have to do, that's what you have to give up. If you want the deeper freedom of having a deep relationship with your daughter, you'll have to restrict your phone usage when you're in the same room as her. You'll have to restrict how you spend your weekends so that you can go take her on trips and build memories with her. You'll have to restrict what you do in the evening so that you have time to be able to help her process her emotions and what happened during that day. You see, restriction, limitation, it, it's not the opposite of freedom. It is the key to deeper. It is the key to deeper freedom. You know what the greatest threat to your freedom is? It's right here. It's the sin inside your heart. Because you know what the heart says? The heart says, eat the food, go to the concert, marry the doll. Our heart is sick. Our heart does not want the right things. It does not know the right path. It does not know the way to true freedom. And so to be set free, we have to be set free from ourselves, not set free to express ourselves. God is not some sort of uh, demonic, uh, sadomasochistic control freak. He wants to put you in a straitjacket. He loves you and he knows the path to deep freedom. And it's not, I do what I want. God is a loving father. He says, don't touch that hot stove. God is a good doctor. He says, hey, you're gonna have to change how you eat. God is a faithful coach. He says, hey, here's how you're gonna have to discipline yourself to get into shape. God isn't putting limits on you because he wants to limit you. God is putting limits because he wants to free you. And he's done it because he has already freed you. In Jesus, you are set free from the power of sin. So don't give back into that slavery. Don't give yourself back over to yourself. This is what the apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could be set free from its powers, that you could enjoy deeper freedoms in your life to become the kind of person God designed you to become. Then he says, stand firm therefore and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. He's saying if Jesus has set you free to enjoy these deeper freedoms, free from sins, free to be the person that God's designed you to be, don't submit yourself to the yoke of slavery. Don't submit yourself to this idea that freedom is self-expression, that freedom is doing whatever I want. Look, you can be set free from every limitation, every restriction in your life, and the only thing you've been set free to do is destroy yourself. Until you are set free from sin, that's all that we have on the table. So which one do you want? You want freedom from limitations and restrictions, freedom to express myself, to do whatever I want? Or do you want freedom from the sin that controls you, that dominates you, that leads you down paths that are dark? Do you want deeper freedom? This makes you think about the story of a guy named Robert McQuilkin. You know, at a pretty young age, he knew what he wanted to do in his future. He wanted to be the president of a prestigious educational institution. In his late 40s, he finally got the dream. He was hired to be the president of a significant college. 
And things were going great until about two years in. His wife, uh, she started forgetting things randomly. Her memory was starting to slip. And so they took her to a doctor. And when they did, they realized that she had uh, early onset Alzheimer's. Now, if you don't know anything about early onset Alzheimer's, it tends to be very fast, very aggressive, very rapid. That's exactly what happened with her. The first thing that happened is she started getting lost in her own house. And when she got lost, she'd go to try to find her husband. And for some reason, she could remember the way to the college. It was about two miles away. So she'd walk to the college to go and find him. The problem was she'd forget that she'd already done that nine times before in the same day. And so her feet were bloody from walking back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Eventually, she lost her ability to think and reason. She forgot how to eat. She forgot how to drink. She forgot how to clothe herself. She forgot who Robert McWilkin was. She didn't even recognize him anymore. And here he is in the middle of his dream at a great university being a president. And he begins to realize that his worst nightmare is happening. I have to pick between my job that I've always wanted, that my heart's always desired, and taking care of my wife. And by the way, taking care of my wife, it is not easy. It is hard. It is heartbreaking. It is difficult to take care of someone who doesn't recognize you, who's confused all the time. And so he knew he had to make a choice and he's going around, he's talking to his friends and almost all of his friends said, look, anybody can take care of her. She doesn't even recognize you. She won't even know who they are. Just put her inside a facility and, and stop worrying about it. You can go visit her you know, on occasion, but there's not many people who can run an institution like this. You've gotta keep this job. And he wanted to, he wanted to follow his heart. His heart said, leave that behind. That's gonna be hard. I wanna be here. This has been my dream. This is what I've always wanted to do but he realized that God wasn't calling him to have the freedom to express himself. He was calling him to a deeper freedom, the freedom to be free from himself. He realized that God was calling him to die to himself, to die to his job, to die to his dreams, and to instead focus on taking care of his wife. So that's what he did. He resigned from his position as president, and he started taking care of his wife at home until she passed away. Which freedom do you want in your life? By choosing to die to himself, he got the deeper freedom of becoming someone who's like Christ, becoming someone who can give of himself, becoming someone who is generous and patient and kind and loving. He got a deeper freedom than he ever could have gotten by staying a president at that institution. Don't settle for the cheap promises that guys like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and whoever else tell you you should go after. There is no freedom in self-expression. The deepest, truest freedom is in being freed from yourself, from your sin. The night before Jesus died, he had what was called a Passover meal with his disciples. And this is what we call communion, but the Passover was actually when they remembered what happened during the Exodus. So the night before, all the Israelites are freed from slavery. Uh, they, they all are hunkered down in their houses and they put blood of a lamb over their doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over them and execute the last plague on the Egyptians instead of them. And then the next morning when they came out, they were free. They were free from Egypt. They were free from that same power. And that's what we remember when we do communion that Jesus is our Passover lamb, that he died for our sins, but not for no reason. He died so that he could set us free from sin. He died so that he could set us free to live like him. When you take communion, that's what you're remembering, not just that I've been forgiven, but that he is resurrected and I've been called into new life. And when I walk out those doors, I've been set free to a deeper freedom, the freedom of self-sacrifice, the freedom of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. The night before Jesus died, he took a loaf of bread with his disciples and he broke it. And he took a bit of it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat in faith. I wanna grab those wafers. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Say this with me. We are one body and we share one bread. Take and eat. On that same night, he took the wine and he poured it into a cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant given for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The cup that we share unites us all together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have died together. We will rise together. 
we will live together. Take and drink. Jesus died for your sake to set you free from the power of sin. Walk in that freedom. Don't submit to a yoke of slavery. Don't submit to expressing yourself, to doing what you want. Receive his limitations and restrictions as a gift, as a good father, as a good doctor, as the good coach, guiding you in the way to freedom, guiding you in the way to enjoy a deep and true and meaningful freedom in your life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we give our hearts to you and we pray that you would set us free. We pray that you would set us free from not only the power of death and the resurrection, but that you would set us free from sin. I pray that our sin, our selfishness, our greed, our pride, our idolatry wouldn't control us. I pray that we wouldn't follow it and call that freedom. That's only the freedom to destroy ourselves. Jesus, set us free from those powers so that we are free to follow you free to take up our cross, free to give of ourselves and loves for those around us. It's your name that we pray, amen. Would you please stand to receive God's blessing? And now would you go forth in the freedom of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't submit to the yoke of slavery, but walk in him. Go in peace. Thanks for worshiping with us.